if you could have, if you could truly have a glimpse of God's love for you, just even a, even a fraction of a glimpse of God's love for you, your whole, your whole world would change. You, you would say, I can't believe, I can't believe how much I have misread this, this evil, angry God who demands this, this unrealistic, impossible perfection. For instead, the God who runs towards us, who wants to embrace us, take us into his arms and welcome us and throw the party for even the feeble effort. All right, well, good to be here with all of you. Grace and peace. I'm going to be uh, talking today about the assurance of salvation. So this has been a subject that I thought we would do in a shorter series, but after the last message I gave, I had conversations with different ones of us, and lots more questions came up, and I felt like there was still more to be done here. So I'm not sure how, how much longer we'll go. It might go short, it might go long, it just depends on on really feedback and until we feel like we've covered this subject adequately. But the assurance of salvation is such an important subject that I would rather us do it well and cover the topic thoroughly than rush through it. So this is actually the fourth message on the assurance of salvation. And uh, I realize a lot of people weren't here for previous messages, and we have now on Zoom different folks who probably haven't heard any of the series. So I hope you can watch some of those online. The first two are up. The third one will probably be up soon. The first thing that I talked about was how important the subject is, that if you don't have good assurance of salvation, you will be crippled in your Christian life. You will constantly be in anxiety and you won't be able to, to just perform the, the normal uh, uh, obedience and, and different things that God calls us to do. I gave that analogy of when you're waiting in an airplane terminal and you don't know you have a ticket to get on because you're on standby and you're like kind of nervous, right? You can't settle down and read a book. You can't rest like people who know they have a ticket. And it's a little bit like that if you don't have assurance of salvation. The Bible calls us to be diligent in appropriating, in ensuring that we have the assurance of salvation. So I read a verse from 2 Peter that says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. That was 2 Peter 1.10. He ends his letter with a similar thought. He says, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So again, there's that word, be diligent. We're supposed to be laboring here. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So three times we've seen that. I'm reading from the New King James here. In 2 Peter 1.10, 2 Peter 3.14, Hebrews 6.11. And then Paul has very similar uh, thoughts in Hebrews and in Philippians here. He says in Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So we are commanded to do this and we are commanded to be diligent. And it's something that requires a lot of effort. So the very first message that I gave on this, I said that the grounding of our assurance was the goodness of God, the character of God, the love of God was the absolute foundation of our enterprise of the assurance of God. And we talked a lot about how in disciplines like Calvinism, theologies like Calvinism, how those undercut the goodness of God because they don't really teach that God wants everyone to be saved. In fact, they don't teach that everyone wants to be saved. I, I've shared this story a couple times, but it's worth repeating. Last summer of 2019, I took a graduate course in Calvinist history from one of the top Calvinist historians in the world at the leading Calvinist seminary in the world. 
And I, uh, as part of this class, we, the whole class, we were reading hundreds and hundreds of pages of primary sources of Calvin. And we were doing a discussion online with the professor and someone, someone uh, raised his hand after reading all this John Calvin and said, Mr. Dr. Professor, um, could you tell me, uh, now that we've learned all of this from Calvin, we wanna go out and teach it, can we say when we go out and preach, especially in evangelism, can we preach that God loves everyone? And wow, it was a tense moment. I remember that very well, uh, where he said, uh, you know, he was obviously thinking about in Calvinism how there's predestination and how God is predestined and chosen many to, to be damned eternally. And the professor thought about it for a little while and he hemmed and hawed and he could tell he didn't quite know how to answer this with confidence. He was, he was uh, candid with that and he said, well, I think you can insofar as we believe that God gives common grace, rain, food, shelter to everybody, even though he doesn't give salvific grace to everyone. And so you can still say in this limited sense that God loves everyone, but just so long as we qualify that with saying that God doesn't love everyone with respect to their, their soul, their salvation. And I thought, whoa. And then he went on to say further, he said, but I would never say when I'm preaching, I would never say to a mixed group that Jesus died for your sins because Jesus didn't die for everyone's sins. He only died for the elect. So I talked about that and, and developed that idea in the first sermon that there is a, a very subtle but very real campaign out there from many different directions to undercut your picture of God. And fundamentally, this notion that, that is out there is that God is not for you, that he is he's against you, or he's disappointed with you, and he, he doesn't even really want you. Uh, there are very, very profound ways that this message comes through. This is one of the main reasons why I, I deeply disagree with Calvinism, because it, it teaches this wrong idea of God. I'll read you a quote from one author who says, and Jerry Walls, who says, Calvinism dis- deprives, deprives those struggling with their faith of the single most important resource available, the confidence that God loves all of us with every kind of love we need to enable and encourage our eternal flourishing and well-being. That's, that's, a, that's a good thought there, that in Calvinism we lose this, this confidence that God is for every single human being salvifically, that he's giving us grace, that he's calling every single person genuinely in reality. Okay, the second message that I gave was on the necessity of standing firm in the gospel. The gospel is not merely our entry into Christianity, but it is the basis in which we stand. And I drew that diagram with the flashlight. And if you missed that message, that is up online, please watch that. It's a very important message where we have to magnify the gospel and the cross as our lives progress because uh, we need a greater, more expansive vision of God's mercy, his kindness, his love for us as we better appreciate the gap between God's holiness and our sinfulness. And then in the third message that I gave last time was about the book of 1 John. 1 John is a book that is dedicated at the assurance of salvation. And the purpose of the book of 1 John is in fact to help us to be assured in our, in our salvation, to assure true Christians. And I read you from 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, where John gives us his purpose statements. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of, Son of, the, God, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So he says, I'm writing to you who already believe. Why? That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And there's these multiple tests, these multiple reinforcing tests that are given in 1 John to strengthen us in our assurance. I want to give a little bit more background on 1 John before jumping into the body of our message here. In order to understand the book of 1 John, we have to understand what the, the main heresy was that he was fighting against 
in, in his time. And in fact, this, is, this heresy was easily the most significant heresy that the church faced for its first 300 years, 400 years or so. And that heresy is called Gnosticism. So what is Gnosticism? Let's talk a little bit about that as we understand better the book of 1 John. So Gnosticism is uh, one of the, the most written about subjects in the early church. They were constantly trying to rebut Gnosticism. And in some ways, there's an advantage that Gnosticism came around, which is that it helped early Christians to clarify a lot of their own thinking. And if it weren't for the Gnostics, we actually wouldn't have nearly the amount of, of writings that we have. The person who was the most dedicated at this task, his name is Irenaeus. He lived in the second century. He wrote in Greek. He lived in modern day France. And it's very interesting. He gives us a history of how Gnosticism began. Now, I'll say that modern historians in general, they don't listen to the early church on Gnosticism. They would rather speculate and make up things out of thin air. But I prefer to go with primary sources and understand how they believe it, it began. But Irenaeus tells us that the Gnostic movement began with someone whose name is Simon the Sorcerer. He's described in the early chapters of the book of Acts. Is uh, this individual who wanted to purchase the gift of being able to impart the Holy Spirit on people. And, and uh, he's rebuked by Peter for that. And as Irenaeus chronicles, uh, Simon, who we know was a great leader even before Christianity came to Samaria, where he was from. He ends up traveling around uh, the Roman Empire. He attaches himself to a woman, who's actually a prostitute, Helena. And the two of them start this movement and they go to Rome and they attract more followers and they're very well received. And again, modern historians don't like to pay attention to Irenaeus there, but I think the whole thing makes a lot of sense because we know that even in Samaria, that Simon called himself the great one, and he was this, this leader who, who attracted people. And so it makes sense that he could do that again. Except the second time when he goes around and he starts this movement, it's now sort of mixed in with a lot of Christianity too. One of the clear allusions that we have to Gnosticism is in the book of 1 Timothy and in 1 Timothy, you don't have to turn to this, but you might want to write down the reference. Paul's writing here and he says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So he says what is falsely called knowledge. Do you want to guess what the word knowledge is there? It's gnosis. Um, so we get our word Gnostic from it. Uh, there's the verb ginosko, um, I know, uh, which is the verb form of the noun, gnosis. And, and here Paul says, Timothy, watch out for this movement of what is falsely called gnosis or Gnostic, knowledge. It says, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Paul dies in the 60s in the first century and Hopefully you know who the last apostle to live was, the, the, the one who lived to the, the longest period in the first century. It was, of course, John. And John makes it all the way to the 90s. So Paul has been dead now for a number of decades. And by the time uh, John is writing, Gnosticism has flourished, it has blossomed, it is spreading like wildfire. It's all over the place. And when he writes his epistle, 1 John, 2 John, he's writing directly to counter this movement that has now gained a lot of steam. It's gained a lot of momentum. We'll come back to this in a little bit. There are, besides Simon the Sorcerer, there's a couple of other names that you should know of famous Gnostics. The, the other most famous Gnostics, uh, one is, his name is Marcion. Uh, Marcion lived in the second century and one of the quirks of Gnosticism is that they taught that the Old Testament God was kind of a sub-God. It wasn't really the true God. He wasn't really the, the father of Jesus. And Marcion, for that reason, deleted the whole Old Testament. He didn't like the Old Testament. He loved Paul, and he made his own canon. That canon was basically Paul and a highly edited version of Luke. So 
the, the Gnostics, for a, a variety of reasons, really gravitated towards Paul and didn't like most of the rest of the apostles. They felt that they were basically Judaizers, and only in Paul and in some of Luke could you really find the truth. Uh, because of Marcion, there were writers who wrote against Marcion, Origen, Tertullian, and others who, who uh, speak about Marcion's beliefs there. The other Gnostic that you should definitely know about, is, he's very, actually very important, his name is Mani or Mani. Mani was a Persian who lived in the Middle East, and Mani was a person who similarly had Gnostic ideas, and his form of Gnosticism, there's many different flavors of Gnosticism. There's not any one, uh, one group that laid claim to it. Most of the Gnostics in the Europe area, the European area, were more loose with their morals. They were quite, quite um, libertine and antinomian. However, the form of Gnosticism that flourished in Iran or Persia was more ascetic. And it was more of a kind of live a, a, an austere life. And the reason that Manny was so important is that Augustine was a Manichaean uh, before he converted to Christianity. And so Augustine, who in many ways defined Christianity for the next thousand years, was very influenced by, by Manny and the Gnostic ideas there. So through Augustine, of course, there's debate on this, but I think a lot of Gnosticism came in through Augustine into the church and ultimately was revived by people like John Calvin. This is so important because if you don't understand the background of Gnosticism, it, you kind of read John's letters and you're like, what's he talking about here? What is this stuff about if you don't confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Like, what is this all about, right? You can read these lines and it just goes over your head. But if you understand the Gnostic background, it makes perfect sense. There is so much Gnosticism that has come into our world today. Many similarities to modern Christianity, views on baptism, views on Lord's Supper, total inability, predestination, it's all over the place. Okay, so let's just really quickly look at a little bit of 1 John here in this light. And we're gonna just see how important it is to understand the context here whenever we look at a book. So if you look, uh, we're, we're going to do a really quick, just fly over here of a, a couple passages. So in 1 John chapter 1, we did this last time, we're going to go at a different angle here. But when he says in the begin in 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes. One of the things that is stressed in the book of 1 John, you'll see this often, is this expression, that which was from the beginning. Okay, so why in the world would he stress this? You might think like, like, wow, aren't you kind of at the beginning? Like, this is the first century here. Well, this phrase from the beginning, aparges, is, is because this Gnostic group was the newcomer, right? They're the, they're the new kids on the block that are trying to take over this Christian movement. And John is saying, no, we're going back to the, the, to the beliefs from the beginning. So he, he, he talks about that. And then in verse 5, of that same chapter says that which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That light, that word light is an important word in Gnosticism. Uh, it has certainly moral dimensions to it, but in particular, they had this notion that the Old Testament God was not really pure. He wasn't really holy. And in creating the earth, this God was mixed light and dark. So we see that concept there. There's this very interesting, we're going to come back to this later, but the, the Gnostics were, particularly the group that he was debating against, they didn't really stress obedience very much because their attitude was like, well, in, in Gnostic thought, flesh doesn't really matter that much. It's the spiritual, it's the intellectual realms that matter that much. It's ordinary matter that's like, ah, whatever, who cares about that? And so because of that, they, they didn't pay as much attention to or have as much concern for actual obedience there. That's rebutted all throughout the book. This is very serious. If you go to chapter 2 now in verses 18 and 19, John says, 
Antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So these Gnostic teachers, he doesn't say like, oh, they're just good fellow Christians, but just different denomination or teaching slightly different things. He's calling them antichrists. Very, very strong language. In chapter 4, he says, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 2, he says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh is not of God. Okay, so again, a lot of people read that and they're like, what in the world is this? Every spirit that does not confess confess that Jesus has come in the flesh? What is that about? Well, this is core Gnosticism. Core Gnosticism teaches that Jesus, being, uh, being the divine, wouldn't dare sully himself and get so dirty with our, our human flesh that he only appeared to come in flesh, but wasn't really of the flesh. Okay, so this is... This is uh, some of the background to the letter. Now, we last time, I'm still kind of reviewing now a little bit here. I'm going to go back and review. He says, uh, we, we talked about how last time uh, there were these tests of assurance. And we, we talked about six tests of assurance that are given in 1 John. There's actually some more, but the ones we talked about are obedience to God, God's commands. Remember that? 1 John 2, 3, this is how we know that we know him if we obey his commands. The second test was loving one another. That's mentioned several times. The third test is our, if our affections are on the world or not. He says, if you love the world or anything in the world, you're, you don't have the love of the Father. The, cl- uh, the clean conscience, answered prayer, and the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Those were the, the six tests that, were, that uh, were given thus far in 1 John. So what we're going to do today is we're going to double click on the very first test here on obeying God's commands. And we're going to spend some time exploring at a high level this concept here. And we're, we'll, um, we're gonna, as you'll see, circle back to something that we talked about in the beginning. Okay, so before we get into the meat now of new content, I wanna stress something here that is really important. And I'm gonna illustrate this with a, a book that I read many years ago. The book was by a surgeon. His name is Atul Gawande. Some of you have heard of him. Um, I've actually met him. He was at the same hospital that I did my residency at. I I highly doubt he would remember me, but I I did meet him. Uh, uh, Really a very impressive individual. Not a Christian, but he's a a very gifted surgeon and a very gifted writer. He's written many books. He's written a lot of uh, very well-written articles if you were to search for him online. And what Gawande decided to do was to kind of get at this question of why are there so many deaths that happen that are called iatrogenic? So iatros is the, is the Greek word for doctor. So iatrogenic is a doctor-induced error. So it's not because you're sick, you go into the hospital and the doctor does some mistake and you end up having complications or even dying as a result. So he's a surgeon and there are many, many examples of, of uh, these iatrogenic errors that occur in surgery. And uh, these errors are tragic because they're preventable, right? Like almost by definition, if the doctor's making a mistake, then he or she should not make that mistake and they should uh, figure out a way to stop that. So. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 of these, er- of these uh, uh, of deaths are caused by iatrogenic errors. That's a lot. I mean, 200,000 people. I mean, that's like on par with how many people have died thus far with COVID. So hundreds of thousands of people are dying every year from these doctor-induced mistakes. And so Gawande says, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to ask the question, outside of medicine, what does excellence look like? And in particular, I'm going to go and look at industries that have a very low bar for making mistakes. Okay, so one of the industries that he goes and he spends a lot of time, uh, now he's a surgeon, like I said, it's totally out of field, but he says, I'm going to go and just going to shadow and learn from people who work in the airline industry. And he says, like, 
that's a pretty obvious industry that you can't make mistakes in, right? Like you're not going to have United or Delta having planes crashing every other week and hundreds of people dying and stay viable for very long. And so he goes and he studies this industry and he says, what makes excellence in those industries where you just can't have failure? And then he goes and he studies some of the advanced engineering and uh, construction industry. So if you go downtown Boston, you see these buildings that are 50 stories high, you know, just impressive buildings. And you think, wow, how do you make a building, a skyscraper like this, on time, on budget, with people you know, doing this construction way up high and people, nobody gets hurt, right? It's pretty amazing when you think about the complexity there. He, he studies excellence at some of the top restaurants in the world. I mean, it's always amazed me at how, if you ever go to a restaurant, they, and one person orders chicken, one person orders fish, one person orders the lasagna, how it'll all come out at the same time and it's hot and it's just like, it's all there, right? Like, how do they do that? I don't know how they do that. I, I've never been able to pull that off. And so he, he, um, he goes and studies these high-end restaurants and like some of the highest rating restaurants and asks like, what does excellence look like? So he writes a whole book about this, distills it down. And in two words, what he comes up with, very simple, he says, it's systematic checklists. That's what excellence is. It's systematic checklist. He says what, what people do is they figure out what excellence looks like and they just iterate through this again and again. And what happens when people make mistakes is they're just overconfident. So the surgeon walks in and they're like, yeah, I've done the surgery a bunch of time. And they just they make a mistake because they haven't, they forgot about one little thing here that they they should have known, but they didn't, they didn't do. And so Gawande, uh, writes a book about this, uh, which I've read, and I'd, I'd recommend to you. And then what he does is he says, okay, well, here I am a surgeon, right? Let's see if this actually works. So he came up with a systematic checklist of 19 questions. It doesn't actually take that long to do. It just takes a few minutes to do. But you do this at key junctions in the surgery, before the patient comes into the OR, before anesthesia, before you, you cut into the patient, before the patient leaves the OR. And so they implement these, these different stages here. Uh, actually, I have a talk where I show the specific items here. And so then they do this. Uh, they, they implement this and they run a clinical trial. They run this clinical trial all, all over the world. They do it in Tanzania. They do it in Jordan. They do it in Canada. They do it in New Zealand. They do it in Seattle. They, they pick intentionally a bunch of diverse sites there. And they say, okay, what happens when we just do this little checklist? Was the results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most prestigious journal in all of medicine. And lo and behold, they find that deaths fell by 50%. They were cut in half by doing a few minute checklist that literally takes not more than, than, uh, than five minutes, but it's just systematic and it forces people to have a certain discipline that they otherwise wouldn't have. Amazing, right? So you can see why that got published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So here's, here's the, the reality, is that I tell you all this because, okay, the flight industry does it because they really care. People are starting to do this more in medicine because human lives are at stake. Shouldn't we do this with respect to our souls? Shouldn't we do this with respect to what has eternal consequence? And yet, we've all had experience in the church, right? How much of the church is this freewheeling, like, yeah, whatever, figure it out, and Everyone kind of does their own thing. And a total lack of careful, systematic, disciplined thought. Uh, we, we're, we're trying to buck the trend. It follows the way. You know, we have this, this uh, spiritual assessment process we go through. I think that's great. I think we can go even deeper. And one of the things I want to do now is I want to give you a little bit of a checklist here. I, I worked on this for a while and I was trying to think about how can we do something here. I, I, I reserve the right to iterate on this, but uh, it's, a, it's a first stab at just some of the categories here of how to think about this first item on what John talks about, which is this notion of obedience, right? And, and I'll tell you, this is, it's so interesting, it's so interesting. I find this just amazing that Human nature is such that we will gravitate towards certain areas of obedience and be very loathsome or neglect or even be hostile to other areas that are found in the Bible. 
our, our nature is just selective, right? That's just who we are as people. And so the, the notion of saying, okay, I want something that's more comprehensive and systematic as opposed to just in keeping with my own likings or my own fancy is incredibly important because this is souls at stake. These are lives at stake. And what I'm going to do is introduce one other concept here, which is the concept of dimensions or axes. So I, I think uh, in, in linear algebra terms, and in linear algebra, there's, there's a sophisticated way of, of doing this, this concept of a basis set or orthogonality in linear algebra, where when you, when you do linear algebra, it's like, it was like one of my all-time favorite math classes that I ever took. It's super useful. But the, the key idea of linear algebra is that, or one of the key ideas of linear algebra is that, is that you need this concept of multidimensional space or n-dimensional space that you can build up using what are called bases sets. Or uh, basically, if you remember, uh, those who have done linear algebra, this concept of these unit vectors that you build up there. So if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But I'll, I'll illustr illustrate it in this way, that... In the same way that when you do, do you do this in trigonometry or calculus? I can't remember now. But when you do trigonometry or calculus, you learn that there's the real number line, which is, has numbers like pi and 1 and 0 and negative 1 and all those numbers. And then there's the imaginary number line, right? And the imaginary number line is the square root of negative 1. And there's all these, you can have, you can have uh, uh, one i or negative i or you know i to the... Uh, I divided by two, and you have a, a real line there, and and a lot of engineering. If you do electrical engineering, what you what you start your plot with is you put the real number line on the horizontal axis and the imaginary number line on the vertical axis, and that one plot becomes the basis of so much of modern engineering. It's how planes fly, and that's how so much of of um, modern engineering occurs. Is this concept of these these uh, these dimensions? In this case, the real dimension and the imaginary dimension. Well, in the same way, there are dimensions of obedience. And it's very easy to wrongfully think like, oh, I know math because I know the real number line. And in reality, you're not comfortable with dealing with imaginary numbers, right? And if, you, if you're not comfortable with imaginary numbers, you can't really do very much math past high school. Like you kind of just, you get stuck. In the same way, what happens in the area of obedience is that you get stuck on an area. You think like, oh yeah, I know obedience. It's, it's this particular dimension. And then lo and behold, you've missed vast other areas out there because you're constrained by little dimensions of thought that you're along. And so when I, when I did this, I, I kept iterating on this several times and, and maybe I'll iterate it again later. But I thought like, okay, what is a, what is a helpful way to, to think about dimensions of obedience, categories of obedience? And I think what you'll find is that in different categories or dimensions here, some of them you'll, be, you'll say like, yeah, that sounds great. I love that. But other areas you'll say like, whoa, like I don't like that or I'm uncomfortable with that or there's different areas in there that uh, maybe I need to wrestle with. But I think they're all biblically grounded. So I'll just, I'm going to run through this here. If you're taking notes, this would be a great, great area to take notes in. So the first area of, of uh, obedience that I was able to, to come up with is, is humility. And this is for very good reason why Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there are so many things that tie into this notion of humility. Uh, it is your prayer life. If you are a person who's self-sufficient, you don't need to pray, right? You're not going to feel that sense of desperate need. Uh, your willingness to receive input when people speak into your life. Do you withdraw or recoil, or do you say like, hey, thanks, I, I welcome that. Uh, fashion, um, I have a sermon online about this that makes the case that fashion and modesty and jewelry, all these things are basically pride issues. Envy, if you envy others, that's a function of your humility. Blaming others versus seeing yourself as the problem. This is right, again, at the middle of the Sermon on the Mount there. There are... I think there's a lot of, of notions of in, in all of this of, of uh, overcoming the, the fear of man, right? So when, when we, people who are, who are trying to 
to, to put on airs or fit in with the crowd or just go along with, with everybody else, well, not surprisingly, they're going to struggle with, with issues of the fear of man. Because in true humility, if you have biblical humility, you realize your position relative to God. And in the fear of man, man is magnified and you want to please man. You know, I, I, I say this often that I think one of the best tests here is, all these are great tests, but one of them is lifting up holy hands, right? This is something that scripture commands us to do and a lot of people are too cool for it or they don't, they don't think they need to do it. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of different subcategories here ranging from, as I said, prayer life to fashion to lifting up, they all fall under this umbrella of humility. Then there's another dimension here. So that's the first dimension. There's another dimension here, which is your, your, uh, your love for God and how are we loving God. So one of the ways that we can tell our love for God is are we giving God regular time and the first fruits of our time, right? They had to give the first fruits of their crops back in the ancient world. We are to be giving the first fruits of our time in our world. Reverent worship our love for the word, I'm, I'm gonna go really quickly through this, um, but love for the word is a great measure of your love for God. If you love a person, you're gonna love their words and how they speak with you. A love for how God speaks more broadly outside of scripture. You know, I, I love when people take notes. I'm a big note taker because when you take notes, whether it's someone who's preaching or whether it's a thought that God uh, gave you or that someone else, spoken to your life, right? when you write that down and cherish that and treasure that, that is, that is how God often speaks to us. Gratitude, joy, the Sabbath, you know, resting, truly resting, or are we in this frenetic pace of life where we can't stop to rest? Not loving the world, that's what John mentions there, where if we love the world, we don't love the Father. Self-denial is a great way to look at our love for God. And then rapid obedience to even what doesn't fit your mind. You know, this is such a great test for if we love God or not. It, or are we, are we trying to make, are we trying to basically uh, agree with God? You know, there's a difference there between obeying and agreeing, right? Like if you, if you tell your child to do something and they don't do it until they understand it and comprehend it there, that's very different than obeying. There's a, a third dimension here, which is integrity. So humility was the first one, loving God, integrity. So that's honesty, having a clean conscience, uh, avoiding things like, of course, theft, uh, not gossiping or flattering. One of the helpful definitions that I like to use for gossip and flattery is, is gossip is when you're saying something about someone that you wouldn't say if they were right there. And that's gossiping. Flattery is when you're saying something to someone that you wouldn't say <laughs> if they were in front of you, right? You're just making stuff up to flatter them. Um, obedience to the law of the land, marital fidelity, not divorcing or marrying the divorced, staying, avoiding gluttony or anorexia, uh, how we uh, spend our time and manage our time. There's a whole set of questions and, and sub-issues around this notion of integrity. Then there's a fourth dimension of loving others. So loving others uh, begins with loving the body, loving the church. We talked about this last time when we looked at 1 John. Uh, you know, just showing up, like being present at, at church meetings is really important. You know, I, I'll, this is the test that I use, okay? This is, I, I, I'm, I'm really exacting on myself here. I tell myself, okay, well, I teach at Sattler, I have a lot of meetings at Eventide, how often do I miss a class where I'm lecturing in? Or how often do I miss when I'm supposed to give a talk at Eventide? How often do I not show to one of those, right? I don't, I show up. Uh, that's, whatever that is for you, that should be your, your floor for how, how much you show up at the church. Like, hopefully your, your, your passion for the church exceeds your passion for work. Right? And again, use that as a good test there. Like whatever your, your miss rate is. Some people do miss uh, well, things like that. But whatever that is, show up. Show up. Just be there. You, got, you can't love people if you're not there in their presence. Uh, 
We live in an age where church gets leftovers uh, and not people's best. I'm, I always remember this. I think I got this from my dad. And my dad uh, often says, you know, son, I still remember this so well. My son, you know, I, he didn't have shoes until he was 18 years old. And that didn't have, don't, not even flip-flops, didn't own anything. And um, he says, you know, we would walk from our house to various church meetings often an hour or two each way. And I remember him telling that, prepping me before I would go and preach in India. He's like, make sure your sermons are long because people, people walk a long way to get here. Don't, don't just give a 20-minute message. I'll be let down. Um, and I remember just he, he drilled that into me. And I said, okay, well, if people back then could, could show that level of devotion. And here we, what are we, driving our cars 15 minutes? Uh, we better show a level of commitment there. Loving others through evangelism. Uh, you know, look at your life. Have you structured your life? Have you built in times where every single week you've got like quality time doing evangelism? Or is it this haphazard uh, deal there, right? That's such an important way to measure your love for others. Loving your enemies, the whole concept of non-resistance. We could spend many hours talking about that in two kingdoms. There's a fifth dimension of gender and family roles. Uh, the, that principle of Titus 2, uh, where there's the household code that's given. And Deuteronomy 6, I've given several messages on this in the last few months about how we're supposed to teach our children all day long. Uh, head covering, views on children and career, views on schooling. I mean, all these things fall under this heading here of, of a dimension of obedience. This is, this is one that it, this is a little bit surprising um, that... Not a lot of people would include here, but there are, I, I put this because there's a whole set of commands in the New Testament on this, but I called it zeal. And the, uh, Jesus commanded us, he says, to be zealous in Romans 12, be fervent, it says. There's imperatives given there that we should be like emotionally exuberant people. We're not supposed to be just cold, stiff people. And, you know, it, it always gives question marks to me when I see someone light up when they talk about some hobby and then I see them talking about spiritual things or in the congregation, and they're just sort of dull and drab. I believe that literally we are to follow what it says in the Bible, where we're supposed to cry out to God, shout to God. It, in Hebrews, it says that Jesus prayed with loud cries and tears. Right? Isn't Jesus our model? Does this mark our, our life here? And this zeal dimension, you could put lifting up holy hands in that as well, potentially. Is, is often neglected, where it's very easy to just be rote in how we sing, how we do things, but we're commanded to be zealous there. The seventh one is one that is often missed in conservative settings. I, I'm, I'm going to call it social justice. Social justice includes several headings that are not popular. Uh, one is, is compassion for the poor, and really thinking here about how we are to be serving the poor, giving to the poor, not storing up treasures on earth. I, I started a company called Eventide, and the whole premise of the company is that, is that America, we often use this analogy that America, people live like mafia wives. Uh, what do I mean by mafia wives? Well, the mafia wife, she lives with her fur coats and her diamond rings, luxurious lifestyle. She knows something shady is going on on the other side of the door, but doesn't want to ask hard questions because she loves her life, right? And at Eventide, we go around, and I, I give a lot of talks on this, about how people live like mafia wives where they don't want to ask questions about what are we doing with our ownership, what, where we're buying and selling from. Are we thinking about supply chains and fair labor and treating people properly there? You know, in James, it talks about how there's going to be this day of woe to the rich. Why? Because they didn't hear the cries of their laborers. You remember that. And a lot of us are like, whatever, like, who, know, who cares about that stuff? It is so true today that there are lots of places today where terrible things are being done with slave labor, very inhumane conditions, care for God's world. You know, a lot of people think this is a liberal issue, but wow, in the Old Testament, we see time and time again that Sabbath meant that you rested your animals as well, right? You had to have compassion on your animals. Jubilee, you had to rest your land. You had to take care of the land and steward the land. Uh, in... Um, I had this other moment, it's one of these jaw-dropping moments. This was in the 90s. I was in medical school. I'll never forget this. It was in a class that we had on, on infectious disease. And this professor got up 
and uh, was was giving these statistics about how many people die of various diseases and where they came from. Obviously, these are infectious diseases, long before COVID, more than 20 years before COVID. And and uh, he was give this session on influenza. Influenza kills ballpark 200,000 to 300,000 people per year, and uh, sometimes more if it's a bad bad strain. And he talked about how the way that the virus does this every year is that it shuffles and it recombines when it, it mixes between pigs, chickens, and people. And it's just basically farming practices that, that involve this recombination there. And I mean, I, I, I never heard this. I never knew this. I just heard of the flu, but I had no idea where it came from and how it kept coming around and how it kept, kept killing so many people. And it typically kills the very old and the very young, uh, widows and the poor. And I, I still remember this just eye-opening experience, like, whoa, if we want to actually help the poor and the, and the, the widows and, and those who are elderly, one of the best things you can do, in fact, maybe the, one of the best things you can do, particularly in the West, is think about how your, your food choices, your, your choices about, about what you patronize there are either propagating diseases or not. Now, this is, again, I realize for most people it's not even remotely on their radar screen. They wouldn't even think about these things. But if everybody pulled together, that would be so many millions of lives saved there uh, as we just follow God's simple uh, concept that he says in Proverbs, the righteous man cares for the needs of, of the animal, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Most people just want cheap stuff to fill their bellies and don't think about these issues of compassion and harming and whatnot. And again, it's just not even on a lot of people's radar, right? And I'm sure as I'm saying this, a lot of people are like, ah, I don't want to think about this. These are seven dimensions here. So the seven dimensions were humility, loving God, integrity, loving others, gender and family roles, zeal, and social justice. I tried to organize this in ways that are fairly comprehensive there and systematic. And you could go through each one of those and just say, like, what am I doing here? Now, this is what's important. And this is, we're going to spend the last 10 minutes or so now on all of this is how do we synthesize this and, and take this in to be useful for us as we think about this concept of assurance of salvation. One of the things that I mentioned this last time, and this is such an important idea here, is that when, when we think about the subject of obedience, it can send a lot of us into despair because a lot of us can say like, well, I haven't done it perfectly. I've, I've missed this, I've missed that. And now I want to circle back and tie in one of the other key mistakes that is a part of the Calvinist system, the, the Protestant system, that impacts probably all of us in ways that we haven't even thought about. Okay, so there is a parallel error. So the first error I said that Calvinism makes is that it defames God's character, right? It makes God out to get people, and it makes God out to, um, when I say get people, I mean that he creates people and does not give them irresistible grace. I shouldn't say out to get people. That sounds more negative than it should be. But he creates people. They don't choose to be created, does not elect them, does not give them irresistible grace. And thus, on the day of damnation, they can say, I'm being damned because I never got irresistible grace. I was not among the elect. Therefore, I will be destroyed eternally. Terrible mistake there. But there's a second mistake that is also very pernicious. Maybe not as bad, but still very bad. And this mistake is that you're always in sin and that even your best actions are filthy rags before God. Okay? You hear this a lot, this filthy rags expression, right? Uh, There's a a, a great sermon that David Berceau has on this that I sign everyone at Sattler in the Fundamental Text class. It's such an important sermon where he shows very clearly that this, this, this filthy rag notion is just wrong. Um, listen to it. It's on YouTube. If you haven't listened to it, listen to it at least a couple times so you really internalize it, take notes on it. It, it became, it's become almost like a meme. You all know what a meme is, right? A meme is like a phrase or an idea that spread really rapidly. Interestingly, the, the verse is never quoted by Jesus. It's never mentioned in the New Testament. 
It's never even quoted once in the whole Anti-Nicene Church Father set. So if you've seen the Anti-Nicene Church Father set, you know it looks like a set of encyclopedias, and they quote from so much of the Bible. They never once quote that verse. And yet, it's become today one of the most popular verses of the Old Testament, right? People say, ah, your righteousness is filthy rags. And I'll read you just a small illustration of this from a very famous Calvinist preacher. His name is George Whitfield who is, was extremely influential in early American Christianity. It's just a, an, an example of this idea coming through. He doesn't use filthy rags in the, in the expression here, but listen to what he says. I can say that I cannot pray, but I sin. I cannot preach to you or any others, but I sin. I can do nothing without sin. My repentance wants to be repented of and my tears to be washed in the precious blood of my dear Savior. Our best duties are as so many splendid sins. Okay, couldn't be more clear than that. He's saying everything you do is sin. He's saying I can't even pray but sin. I can't preach but sin. I can't even repent without repenting of my repentance. And then I have to repent of that repentance of the repentance, right? It's like, it's this unending chain of sin that we're just wallowing in. You hear this all the time, all the time. And I uh, man, the number of times that I've heard, your righteousness is filthy rags. Uh, it's just, you can't count it, right? Okay, what has this done? Well, it, it almost makes this whole concept of assurance one of just like dread because now... The Bible says that this is how we know that we've come to know God if we obey his commands. But then on the other hand, we're being taught, you can't obey, you're always sinning. Like, what do you do? You're like, you're totally destroyed by this contradiction. It's really, really sad. I, I told you this last time, and I'll, I'm going to say it in slightly different words but, uh, today. That this is really important here. That, that when, when we ask the question about obedience. One of the main things that I look for is something like the lack of a settled defiance or a settled ignorance. Okay, what do I mean by that? A settled defiance is where you're just going to do what you're going to do and you're not even going to really wrestle with this and you're not going to change and make positive steps there. Or settled ignorance, I think of the ostrich that has its head in the sand, right? You're just, yeah, I'm just not even going to go there. And I had lots of conversations with people that don't even want to go there with discussions of particular areas. They've just walled off. Like, I'm just not going to go there. I just can't think about that. I'm not going to go there. Settled defiance means that something on that list that I just told you about, you're not going to wrestle with it. You're not going to pursue that. You're just going to live in a bubble. Living in a bubble is very scary. If you are living in a bubble with any of those dimensions of sins that I just talked about there, please, I plead with you to stop and rethink what you are doing. The problem that we have fallen into here is we have now taken this notion of filthy rags. And by the way, I'll just give like two minutes on filthy rags because you should listen to the hour-long sermon that David Brousseau gives here. But just, to, just a really quick rebuttal of this idea. First thing is that Isaiah is the speaker there, not God. So he's, he's, he's praying to God in this kind of lament poem, and it's not actually God's speech there. So we always have to be careful when it's quoting from a human author, because often human authors may be wrong, or they may be using hyperbole or some other, some other um, literary tool there. And in fact, here I think what's going on is this classic Hebrew lament poetry, where in Hebrew they often speak in very hyperbolic terms. One of my favorite examples is David in Psalm 51. Remember what David says there? Psalm 51 is his famous prayer where he has, uh, he's uh, slept with Bathsheba, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he's killed Uriah. And then what does he say in that prayer? He says, God, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And I, I think that's like, serious, David? Like, you can say against you and you only? When you pray to God, like, what about Bathsheba? What about Uriah? What about the whole Israelite people? You were supposed to be out as king, leading them in the battle. You're not supposed to be hanging out back in Jerusalem. Like you've, sin you've sinned against a lot of people there, but he's speaking hyperbolically, right? And people in Hebrew poetry do this a lot. And uh, that's one key point here. The second point is that there are many times in the Bible where it says that 
different acts of obedience that God delights in and that he's pleased with them. And we can't take that as a standalone that cancel all that out. You know, even pagans, God, God says that about. So remember the story of Cornelius where the angel comes to him and says, your, your prayers and your alms have risen up as a memorial to God. You know, just, that Cornelius was favored, that this, this, he pleased God with his acts of obedience there. So many examples like that. Job, Noah, Daniel, there's lots of people that, that please God and that God delighted in. So Isaiah 64 is simply totally misused, and it's this meme that's taken over our world here, unfortunately. So what do we do here? What we need to do when we think about any of these issues is not go down the guilt trip that, that this kind of George Whitfield idea is, is based in. It's just wrong. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong. We have this mathematical notion of like, could you have, have gone a little bit, worked a little bit harder or a little bit, like, of course you can, of course. Like, I, I, you can take anything. Could you have prayed an, another minute longer? Yes, I could have prayed a minute longer. You can play that game and find that you are constantly racked with guilt over this Protestant misuse, Calvinist misuse of this notion of filthy rags. Okay, what I want us to do is instead of using a mathematical standard where you could always add one, right? In math, like no matter how big the number, you can always add one and it gets bigger, okay? And that's why like infinity is, is, can never be reached. We are finite creatures and you can always try to guilt yourself. Like I could have prayed another hour, I could have worked more, I could have done another this, another that, another this, another that. Okay, it doesn't work with finite creatures. It just doesn't. Instead, instead of a mathematical standard, what we ought to be doing is using a fatherly standard, a good fatherly standard. Okay, what do I mean by this? And this is especially for those of you who have had good fathers or hopefully are good fathers, this will make a lot of sense. What a good father does is they take what their children do and they are, are they looking for perfection or are they looking for just sincere effort, right? Of course, they're just looking for sincere effort. They're not looking for perfection. Like, what father is ever doing this? Um, I will even go as far as to say that there's almost something endearing about an effort that is less than perfect so long as that it's sincere. There's, I have a file that I keep uh, in my, on my computer. It's actually stored in the cloud, and I update it often, where one of, one of our children will do something that is endearing, and I will write it down, and it's, it's almost always an imperfection in what they did that I find to be tender there. So I have a long list. Uh, I was looking at this before. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read a couple of these uh, here just to give you an illustration. Uh, there, one of our children uh, has, has recently been speaking more, and the way that he uses the word, that he's trying to say the word rhinoceros, he says nosinus. He'll look at something and say nosinus. And I love that. I just love that he can't even say rhinoceros perfectly and will say nosinus instead. And to me, that's endearing. Now, am I going to say, that's filthy rags. You can't say that. Like, like, what in the world? Like, it just, it doesn't make any sense that any father would, would use that kind of ridiculous standard there. Um, the, the way that this child, I'm, I'm saying these things because he can't, totally understand what I'm saying here. Um, you know, we're, t we're teaching all these animal sounds, right? And of course the rooster says, cock a doodle doo, right? And, and uh, the way he does it is cocky doo, cocky doo. And I just love that, cocky doo, right? Um, and so again, like I have this long list of, of things that I write down where imperfections don't become basis of like, I'm gonna like, swat them or say like that's filthy rags that's not good enough or anything like that it's a term of dear what i'm looking for what any good father is looking for is what just sincerity effort just are you putting a good faith effort in and and any father would be pleased with that as is god i think of the the story of the prodigal son one of my favorite stories that jesus gives there and of course the prodigal son has made a mess of his life he's squandered the wealth he's lived it in riotous living he's He's um, depleted all of this money, and he goes and is eating from uh, 
uh, working with pigs, a you know, Jew now working with pigs, and comes back. And I picture him disheveled, stinking, because he's been working with the pigs. I picture him just not really being this amazing sight of, of like perfection there, right? And again, like, does the father go to the son and say, you are dressed in filthy rags, son. You stink. I'm not going to get near you. I, even your coming to me is not good enough. Like, you got to repent of your coming to me, right? Like, <laughs> of course not. The whole point of that parable is that what does the father do? He runs to the son. However, however incomplete and imperfect, imperfect the son's obedience is, and embraces him, right? And throws this lavish party for the son, knowing that what, what counted was even just this feeble effort that he made. You know, he, he had this whole prepared speech that he was probably rehearsing in his mind as he was coming back to the father. And these kinds of things, like, come on, it is a good father here. And so with all of these, these questions, I would urge you to reject the meme of this false notion of the filthy rags, and to instead recognize that God smiles, delights, is thrilled over efforts here of making obedience there. If you could have, if you could truly have a glimpse of God's love for you, just even a, even a fraction of a glimpse of God's love for you, your whole, your whole world would change. You, you would say, I can't believe, I can't believe how much I have misread this, this evil, angry God who demands this, this unrealistic, impossible perfection for instead the God who runs towards us, who wants to embrace us, take us into his arms and welcome us and throw the party for even the feeble effort. So this is a very, very foundational concept here that I hope you can now hold together here. On the one hand, yes, we are commanded to be diligent and to be systematic in our obedience. And let's, let's do that with zeal. Let's do that with a, with a hearty effort. But let's not do it with this demonic, Gnostic, Protestant notion of, uh, of an obedience that, impos- <laughs> that is impossible to achieve and instead recognize that we are coming to a Father who is running towards us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we repent of, of, uh, of the ideas that we have imbibed of you uh, being anything less than one who delights over our, our obedience and our sincerity, however feeble it may be. God, you are a good father who delights in, in our efforts of, com- of coming to you and that uh, rather than wanting to put guilt trips over adding one, uh, that you just want to embrace us and, and accept us and, and love us. Father, I pray that we would reject these ideas and instead recalibrate our minds to the God of Jesus, the Father who, who longs to embrace the Son. And I pray that as we build up our, our assurance of salvation, that we would look, yes, yeah, systematically at these efforts, but God, that we would also... Uh, look at them from your vantage point and one of, of uh, incredible accommodation and acceptance despite our imperfections. God, you know our frame. You know that we are but dust. You see our efforts. You see that we are lost sheep that, uh, that need a shepherd. And we thank you that you are willing so often, God, to come to us time and time again and pick us up on your shoulders and carry us home. We pray for that again this evening. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.